View from the Gutters, episode 40. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Strange Attractors, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 4501. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. ready. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, It's episode 40. Yeah. Whoa, Jesus. Jesus. (laughs) You just like... You just like had in it. Oh, it's robot voices back again. Hang oh, on. you broke it, Jack. <laughs> Welcome to View, View from, from the, the gutters, gutters, episode Epi- forty. That's yeah. episode forty. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big yeah. number. We all we, we did all did it. I think I think we're aging gracefully. Time. By yeah. the way, I'm, I must say, forty is the new thirty for us. So. Yeah, that's true. Well, I actually almost well, 30 am forty, like, and the first person ago. that tells me that forty is the new thirty is fucking going out the nearest window because. Oh crap! Well, I don't remember. <laughs> the podcast for the oh. podcast it can be. I can have okay. a double standard. The oh, podcast awesome. for the podcast forty can be the new thirty, but for me, Joe, just remember sixty is the new twenty. Yeah, I know. I'm looking forward mm. to it actually. By the time I'm sixty, sixty will be the new fifteen. And my robotic... you can go back to high school. <laughs> my robotic body is like a horrible movie. <laughs> I'll be climbing Mount Everest in my robotic body. Well, my Why grandchildren you fly around me in their jetpacks, jet yeah. and because that's right. why else would I get a robot body for jetpacks and rocket fists? Well, also chainsaw oh, hands, rocket and the strength fists. of five gorillas, the strength yeah. of five gorillas. That's true, and the body that's... of Adrian Barbeau. But it's only five feet tall. Well, that's fine. <laughs> we're not gonna. We're not All gonna right. nitpick. What okay. do you think this is? A cartoon right. on Adult Swim? We're not All gonna right. argue about that. All right, I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Joe Pretty. I'm Matt McGinnis. I'm Tobias Panchin. And I'm Cade Reynolds. And we're talking about uh, strange attractions, right? Strange, strange attractions. attractions. Strange attractions. I don't want to talk I about. Strange... I should know the name of the fucking. I don't book. want to talk about strange attractions because uh, I really don't feel comfortable with all of you yet. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Matt. Oh, oh, strange well, you know. attractions. It's just a bottle of strange um, attractions. <laughs> yeah, so I pitched this book. I liked it. I think everybody should read it. Uh, Joe, what do you think? That, 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 that's my review. <laughs> Good job, Joe. Um, I want to hear what you guys have to I say. Agree. To be I honest, I like this book. I think it, I thought it was entertaining. I had fun reading it, um, and yeah, I would. Okay, I object. I object <clears throat> on basic principles because this is a book about math wizards. And okay, you but love it. okay. So and here's that, the thing that bothers me. <laughs> there is, this should be. Uh, for you. And I'm going to make this starting. as clear as I possibly can. There is no, absolutely no math in this book. I saw some. It's numbers very somewhere. nice to like toss around the <laughs> no, idea they're, of complexity they're theory. Like, there's numbers on the, on the blackboard behind oh, yeah. him when he talks in the beginning. Uh, this is gonna, I'm sorry, I forgot all of you fucking studied math. No, wait, you didn't. I did. I studied math so, for like 12 years. It was called high school. Yeah. And junior high. There I went to high school for 12 years. Yeah, I did. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> My God, man. Um, I happen to know that's not true because you'd still be in high school and you were in college with me. Are you doing those what? two things No, I started at the age of five in oh, high school. Okay. Oh, okay. I got you. I got you. <laughs> I just I um, skipped ahead. I was gifted. So there... I used to manage to finish. I was a genius. Was 17. Yeah. <laughs> Who couldn't graduate um, high school? The, 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 the mathematics and the mathematician and the graduate student mathematician, that's all very nice conceits for the book. There is no math in this book. Complexity theory and chaos theory <laughs> are not... Pres- yeah, are, and are only they- tangentially related to the things that they're talking about in these books. And there is very little actual mathematics, and, and which is good. That's why they're math wizards. There is some graph like, theory. These are not mathematicians. These are math wizards. And if I'm reading a, if I'm reading the Lord of the Rings, I don't need to know how Gandalf casts a fucking light spell. I just have to know that he and does. That's, right. These guys are math wizards, that's and they're true. using math that's, spells that's, to make things awesome. And I don't need to know why. And that's fine. And that's I agree with you completely. But we can't talk about this book in terms of mathematics because it's complete and other bullshit as far as mathematics go. So the math wizard things work. Yeah, that's what. Well, and that's just because you don't what know was, the math they're doing doesn't mean that no, they're not I, doing that. It's math. not about that. <laughs> it's not about the math at all. It's about no, the idea it's about, of using uh, the concept of math. To affect change in the world. Which brings me to, um, I, I think that the idea that you can somehow do this, this has been, for the last few years in pop culture, you had numbers, you had that ridiculous show about the autistic boy, 
And you had uh, Joe, you owe me a dollar. Um, <laughs> Talking about touch had, or whatever? No, touch, yeah, whatever uh, it was. A horrible key for I can't, I can't show. remember, oh. yeah. And the thing is, is that there is this idea because math, especially pure math, is very, very abstract. And there is this, and, and for centuries, people have been obsessed with it as this language to describe nature, describe the, the, na- the way of the universe. But that's all kind of wrapped up in a very specific way of thinking about it, which is nice, and it's very interesting philosophically. But for me to read these things, I have to divorce those two things immediately because th- there's a lot of stuff that gets, you know, people get wrapped up in the metaphysics of it, and it's just not true. So that's, as, as something, I think this did a really good job because it takes the Barry Ween tact of science, which is that right. this is the stuff we're using, it's this, and that's all you need to know about it. Right. So well, it's like and it's, exactly what Toby was saying. Yeah, like, exactly. The math yeah. wizard thing, I think it's a good way of looking at it. Well, like uh, we were talking before we started recording about Angels of S.H.I.E.L.D., and one of the things that bothers me about that show is that they're constantly throwing out all these computer terms like RSA encryption and TCP and just – talking about all these like just throwing it's out TTP. these words the thing that you're talking about is vaguely related to what's going on but not really and I think yeah. that the show would be better if they just like ignored all of that and just like yes I hacked the encryption and now this thing is open and let's, well, let's well, it's like bad medical shows where it's like well, it's just inaccurate and they're just throwing around numbers babble. numbers is an excellent and, and like, example and, but of no the, my, my point is that that's the thing episodes. in every TV show ever is mm. that Anytime people talk about computers, the things that they're actually saying have almost nothing, nothing to do to with do. the way computers work. <clears throat> and the further that they stay away from the details, the better. Because it's right. just like, and then a science thing happened, and then the plot moved along. It's and that's how this <clears throat> For example, works. Die Hard. Yeah. At that, no point when he's hacking into the safe does he tell you what he's doing. No, totally. The hacker is just pressing a lot of buttons on the keyboard, and you are, as, a, as an unknown, <clears throat> you know, you're just totally with it. And that's perfect. Right. And that's what this story does. Mm-hmm. They're doing math to do things and they don't ever tell you the math and it's yeah. not real math it's just it's, it's wizardry fiction. it's wizard it's, math it's magic it is. and even, and that's even exactly like, what it should be because even the mathematicians in the book think that this guy is insane and I like, think that the professor uh, I can't remember rocker. his name but they think he's crazy so even people who have studied math are like that's not math that's and, just yeah. nonsense so and the it, thing, that's it lends the, itself well it's the thing that saves this book because if he had tried to weave this in and I had to, yeah. I I tried to watch numbers while I was taking my upper my uh, like uh, soft uh, soft junior level math class, which is all a bunch of crazy stuff that nobody wants to hear about. And Yay. it's this, it's based on this whole idea. I study math, therefore I am good at every math, and every math is good for something, which is absolute bullshit. Even at a graduate level. You know the stuff you learned to get there, and then you specialized in something, and that's yeah. it. Well, if you special, that. if you have your PhD in differential equations, you're not going to be able to just bust out complexity theory and start doing that shit. Batman if, could. Yeah, well, it's, well like, okay. it's like most TV. Granted, experts, right? but we're not talking about Batman here. <laughs> we're talking about uh, the guy from Northern Exposure's little brother, who's also. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no idea. I've never talking seen about numbers. Mr. Universe. Uh, what the fuck is his name? Rob? I don't, I don't, I don't know. We don't know. Uh, I can't. Anyway. I don't know. know. He's, he's Bernard in, uh, Wait. in yeah. Santa Claus. That's, yeah. that's the reference I'm No, that's gonna... two different people. Rob it's Morrow is Rob the Morrow. F- thank that's you. That's the FBI guy. Yes. That's the math guy. No, that's his little brother is the math guy. Yeah. And Judd Hirsch is their father. Yes. But it's, anyway. I mean, to me, it's just like, I'm sure there are plenty of people that could watch that show and enjoy it because they don't know about it. But within the first 30 seconds of, of him being introduced, I was already screaming bullshit. And okay, it was well, all I could do to well, get through just, the first. It's just like in, the a, thing in every is, TV is that show. the first three episodes are all based on real cases. But the the key point being is that each case was actually solved by a different mathematician. Well, so in well, the yeah. first three episodes, he's playing three different mathematicians. And if they want to make that show, I would watch the shit out of it. <laughs> well, but it's like, no, and and that's kind of to to tie this right. back to Strange Attractors. That's what makes this. I went into this book ready. I'm like, you're gonna try and feed me a spoonful of shit, but I know what you're talking about. But they don't. They're very much like you have as much information as you need to follow the plot. Right, and that's all we're going to give you. Well, and that's when I was pitching and I was trying to say, like, look, it's as, as much as it is about like math wizardry, like it's so much more about the relationship between the grad student and his, you know, mentor essentially, and the grad student and his girlfriend. Well, it's, like, it's all about relationships. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. that's the enti- the entire book is about how all things are interconnected. Right. Yeah. 
and how by adjusting your relationship to things and making small changes, you can have large effects over time. Right. Well, Which I think is a great message. Like, I, yeah, I really too. love the idea of, like, by making a small change, you can affect the world. Yeah. And, and it's, I think that's it's a good message. It's true. I think it's a good message yeah. for people to hear. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned uh, the relationships, and I actually have a bone to pick um, with one of the relationships in this book. Pick your bone. Um, and I'm not saying that this is a bad book. I actually really enjoyed it. This, there was this one thing that took me out of the book, and so I wanted to mention it. I did not believe that the girlfriend was a very realistic character um, because um, to leave him like that, you know that she was already taken out of the relationship. And I don't think it was very realistic that within two panels he showed her something and she was just like back on board like that. It was quick. But I also feel like she didn't. She like she walks out of the apartment. And she like leaves the relationship. But it's n- I. I never get the understanding that it's like, look, we are so broken up that I will never see you again. Yeah, like yeah. it's not that oh, kind no. of hate. It's just like, look, get your shit together. I'm leaving. In the meantime, like, please right. figure yeah. yourself. She out. wants like, an my, effort from him. But I my do agree perspective with, so, is with that Kate, no. like, you know, people say things when they're angry that they don't yeah. necessarily mean like, you know, I've been in relationships where like everything blew up and then like. Later that day, it was like, I I was wrong. I didn't right. mean that. I was angry. Let's yeah. let's just work this out. Like that, that part felt that weird. didn't that didn't really feel like a problem. To me. Yeah, what felt like was too quick was how willing she was to just basically drop a lot of what she was doing to help him at the end of the book. That's, yeah, that's, that's what, that's I, what I, I'm I feel like saying. he needed to it's win like, her over a little bit more exactly. before that. But I I like. I like that she helps him at the end. Like that's one of my favorite parts of the book. Is yeah, that she's no, basically is... willing to be like. No, I'm I'm gonna trust you on this. I I love you, and I'm gonna trust you, and like that, which is an important part of you know their relationship is trust. And I think that that I think that part was nice. I do I do agree with Kay though. It would have been cool to see him like win her over a little bit more, but I don't know. I'm I'm willing to concede that. I mean, really, the the book is from his perspective. It's about his relationships specifically, yeah, more than anybody else's. And that part was a little bit hasty. Yeah. But I don't really feel like it diminishes the book as a work. I do feel like the end oh, I don't, has a total... Like, I don't think it diminishes end. the book at all. I just... That kind of took me out of it. So that's... I mean, that's my only bone. I, I do feel I like feel, the end is a little bit rushed. I was like, just I think it that. needed like 20 more pages, and maybe. I see that's... But, and I, I, I agree that the ending is rushed. I don't agree that it needs more pages. I feel like the first part of this story could have been cut down by the amount you needed at the end. Yes. The fr- I mm. I remember that first issue especially I was reading it and I got to the end and I'm like was that really just one part because it feels very very long and then the end wraps up really really quickly yeah and I, so I would have liked to see that shift a little bit and it's as far as criticisms go it's it's a nitpick right like, no overall I, did, I enjoyed I this. agree with you but I'm thinking about it as like single issues. Yeah. If you hadn't gotten as much information in that first issue, I think that the series may not have been successful because you need a lot of information to go forward into book two. Absolutely. And I hate it when you buy an issue number one of a new series and like almost nothing happens. And well, you're like, why this, would I pick up? Was this actually released as single issues? I or think was this was original premier. graphic novel? Because it doesn't, in the copyright information, it doesn't say anything about yeah, I think collecting this is issues released. one through four. Like, I think that this was released just as a book. Hmm. And I think it, I, I agree, like, when I got to the end of part one, I was like, wow, was that just the first part? Like, that feels way longer than just an issue. But I think that's not issue one, that's part one. Hmm. Well, and I... I and that, yeah. that that did change my perception of a little bit. Yeah, no, totally. And it's it's, I don't... It's like I said, it's 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 a criticism only in the most like smallest uh, meaning of the word, which is I real I enjoyed this for the most part. Uh, I just feel like some of that part one could have been taken. Some of those pages could have been used to to kind of not. I don't. It's not. It's not like what we were talking about with supermarket, where the ending just rushes and you're kind of not sure what's going on. Right. It's that. It, it 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 feels rushed. Like everything is there, and because everything is there, that's why it feels rushed. You mm. need a couple more, even like two or three more pages just there at the end. I think yeah. would have allowed a little less hurrying, you know. And I understand that the end of the book 
feels frantic for the most part because of what they're trying to do. Yeah. But that's why I think it would have been nice to have... You could have thrown in a couple breakdowns in there where you were getting his whole thing and, you know, just kind of... It's like putting the brakes on to emphasize the speed of everything that's going on around you. But yeah. that's... I mean, it's, That being said, I I was a huge fan of the beginning of this book. I read yeah. it in like a couple of sittings. So unusual for me to read a trade in more than one sitting. And so... I, I read like the first third of it and then set it down and came back to it a little bit later and read like, you know, the next day, I think, and read a bunch. And then I waited like a week to read the ending. But I the first half of this book, like really is what drew me into the story, like all the setup that takes place, like how deep the characters feel, how deep the world feels like that world building of of our own reality was taken into account like with a lot of care like it's easy for books that are set in the modern era to just kind of gloss over the setting because it's like it's new york you all know new york fuck it but this took a lot of time to like set up like the places that he's going and what's happening and the relationship between like where he is and like in his life not like physically but like where he is in his life and his relationship to his his uh advisory board and the school his relationship to his girlfriend and how he meets him at like i found that all like really helped to build like his his universe even well, though it is modern i mean one thing that i did really like about this story um was the more so than i mean it, people say all the time oh the setting was a character you know the city was mm-hmm. a character but i think more so in this book than almost any other book um <coughs> it really is a character i mean it's yeah. a part of it it's it's something that drives the, the story forward it's mm-hmm. it's ever present it's it's the interaction between these math air quote wizards it's, um, uh, it's one scrap of fabric in the grand tapestry that is the myth of New York City there you yeah. go well I love his forward like, to New York like in in the forward he talks about how much he loves that city yeah like, you, and it's apparent in the book definitely well, I, I use that term very deliberately like mythic New York yeah. not the city itself that right. exists in our own reality but our idea of it and all the stories that have been told about it, right. I think, are a thing. Yeah. Not like a character in this story, but a character in our n- global consciousness. Yeah. It's yeah. it's very romanticized in no, the same way that like Paris is Or Camelot. Yeah. Right. Like we you know, we have this myth of King Arthur and mm-hmm. Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table and all of these things right. that kind of it just exists in our culture our all around the world. And yeah. I think that New York is that thing at the same time that it is a real place where people yeah. live. Yeah. And I think that this story does a good job of creating that place. Yeah. Or and, of summoning that place. I and guess. well, kind and, of compared to a lot of like modern superhero books that are also set in New York, but in no way take on any of the character of New York. Like this does a really good job of being like, look, New York's important. It's important. The setting is important in this story. Yeah. Um, and kind of jumping off that to you, one thing, like, uh, a weakness in the book, I thought, or a strength and a weakness, I thought, in the book. Uh, the art. Um, I thought that the art was able to capture the city really well, and there's some panels that are really beautiful, but at the same time, I I personally felt like the art, the um, and I, I, I struggle to kind of pinpoint whether it was the pencils or the colors um, or exactly what it was, but it seemed like it was really hard at times for me to distinguish... Um, the faces of the characters and mm-hmm. to get their emotion and I feel like at times they're portrayed as such calculating people that having that at times it's okay but at other times when there's some really emotional things going on especially like the, the interactions between them um, the two uh, mathematicians and then mm-hmm. um, you know the one mathematician and his girlfriend and stuff like that it's really important to be able to get that emotion yeah I do um, feel like some of the uh, the expressions could be a little more clear I, well, I think it suffers from being too realistic yeah I, was I mean female our faces are expressive mm-hmm. but like we're very very good as creatures at recognizing facial expressions and yeah. so like the amount that a face actually moves when it makes an expression is not that much. Right. And a lot of expression is the face in motion. Like faces look really weird when they're just captured still in the middle yeah. of doing something. Like when you pause a video. Or we accidentally take a picture of someone when they're trying to make like, a face at you and yeah. you just get just weird, weird photos. Yeah. I think that this suffers a little bit from being so realistic and the expressions aren't necessarily clear. Yeah, I didn't 
think about this when I was pitching it or reading it, but now that I'm looking back at it, uh, it reminds me very much of Tony Harris's art in uh, Ex, Ex Machina. Um, yes. And yeah. there's a great section in the back of one of those trades, and I cannot remember which one it is, but where he talks about how he does the layouts for his panels, where he'll pose his friends and do, you know, photography of them, and then that's how he chooses to lay out the lighting and, like, create the depth of field that he creates. Um, and it was a really interesting read. And I feel like this this art, the Greg Scott art in this, is a lot like, is really drawing from that Tony Harris uh, kind of style of, like, photorealism, with, but with heavy line weight. Um, so, I don't know, maybe go find that because i feel like tony harris is a little bit better about the facial expressions Mm -hmm. um but he's also tony harris has been doing this for a lot longer because you look at his early stuff in uh starman and it's not nearly as strong as this stuff later on so i i think that the art was awesome i loved the colors in this book i felt like they really complemented the book well um, I thought the line art was like detailed enough that I, I was interested in like dug into the panels really well. And I thought the art was really strong. I'm excited to see more stuff from Greg Scott now. I liked it too, although it isn't necessarily my preferred art style. Mm-hmm. But uh, after I finished this last night, I did ha- hand it to my brother, Adam, who was mm-hmm. on the episode a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he handed it back to me like a half hour later. It's like, I can't like, I can't deal with this art. Really? Yeah. Hmm. And, like, I, I've had that issue before with certain artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I acknowledge that that's totally a thing. And I could absolutely see somebody picking this up and looking at it and be like, I, yeah. I just can't read this. Like, it's not... It's very It's different. not comprehensible to me. Yeah, it's very different from what's going on in a lot of comics. It, it doesn't feel like that muddy, stylized kind of feel that Vertigo has, where it's, like, very clearly cartoon like cartoonist style where the faces are much more expressive and like Mm -hmm. kind of abstract but i also feel like it's not close enough to photorealism that it like you know i don't know Uh, it it was not a problem for me but i could see how it could be a problem for somebody else yeah Uh, i did want to go back though and talk uh, for just a second about the um the length issue that joe was talking about and sitting here thinking about it like i really loved this comic i think it's great for what it was i recognize that it has some problems but the thing that I was thinking about is that I could actually see this being the length of something like Transmetropolitan. Mm. Oh, and one of the strengths of Transmetropolitan is that it is so long. And so there's so much time for the character and the story to be built up over time mm. and for them absolutely. to do different arcs and for something to happen at one place and then brought back much later and have yeah. that really big emotional impact that you get from things that are built slowly over time. Yeah. And I think that this is a comic that would benefit from that sort of style. If this was yeah. five times longer than it is. I definitely and think... And that they added so much more story to it. I mean, it would be a very different story, but yeah. I think that that would work. I think like one of the... chain of events that, you know, Vita uh, plays, or... The chain of events that starts from the right Vita, Vita. Severin in Transmetropolitan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I also I think that it's worthy to note that I'm I think that this is I, it's Charles Soule right is the author. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I guess I would say that. I think this is his second work really okay. after Twenty Seven. So as a sophomore effort, this kind of yeah I think is amazing. But, like, I, I would love really, really I would good. love to see that like six seven hundred page right. story where he's actually putting things in the beginning of the book. That affect the end of yeah. the book, like actually ha- weaving those patterns through the entire story. And I'm excited to see him get a chance to do a longer series because what he's done so far is like a short story with 27, a short story with 27 part two, and then a short story with this. Like I'm really excited. Hopefully he'll get a chance to do a longer work because he had. I think he has the chops for it. Like his yeah, writing absolutely. is like really strong, and something like that would really be a master work. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would. I think done right, it would be up there with Transmetropolitan or like Bone right. which um, Jeff Smith was working on for 10 years yeah and if I think that he has the chops based on what I've read here mm-hmm. to do something like that yeah in the future and I also think he's got a lot of great ideas because both 27 and this book were so different than what's going on in comics right now that like this is the kind of fresh writer that I'm like excited about in comics it's like so far from everything else that's going on that, it, that it's something I could be really excited about. So 
I read this on a total whim because the Archaea Press hardcovers are beautiful. Mm. I opened it up, flipped through it. It has a fold-out page, which I'm a sucker for. It has a like, double fold-out <laughs> Yeah, page. and I was like, woo! Yeah. And so I was like, I'll try this. I started reading it. I, I, you know, I read half of it in the shop because I couldn't put it down. It was like... Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I don't think I've been as excited about a book that we've talked about since Brandon Graham last year. Nice. That's that's so funny because I enjoyed this, but I I read it and I kind of put it down and I felt well. I read that. I mean, I don't have great things to say about it. I'd like to see what he does in the future. Uh, well, I and I, I love wizards. I love yeah. wizards more <laughs> than anything. And like, if you strip out everything else, no, and like if you totally. strip all the details out of the story, at the very heart of it, it's a story about wizards. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I I understand that. And I don't. I don't want that to come off as sounding like I have negative things to say about this. I really don't. I mean, I appreciate, I think you raise a good point. Considering what's going on in comics right now, this is great. This is completely unlike most of what's going on. And I think we need a lot more of it. And I think this showcases the beauty of like the whole you know, indie publishing thing where yeah. you can write stories like this and there is an audience for it. Is it as big as the superhero audience? Probably not. Oh, but I think it's grow. bigger, to be honest. I think well, it's much I think, bigger. We just right. like have no, not figured out a good distribution method. I think that's method. the thing, is that there is, potentially, it is much bigger. Yeah. But, like, as it stands right now, people are buying superhero comics, well, right? But just, stuff like this is going to ensure that we get the new blood in there that we desperately need, well, th- and that that audience grows. I also feel like a book like this, uh, we were talking about it, re- relating it to like television and other media, Like I think a book like this has a lot more appeal because I think there are more fans of stuff like this than there are fans of superheroes. Yeah, books. right. I mean, I think that the fact that superheroes are so dominant in the comic medium is a disservice to the medium itself. I agree. And I feel like if more people knew that things like this existed... And had the grounding in comics to be able to read them and appreciate them, I think that it would be a vast, a great boon to comics oh, as absolutely. a medium. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Like I think that we really need people to know about things, and we need things. I think that we need things like this to exist, and we need people to know about. Well, it's why I'm all absolutely. for the digital distribution market. And like when when tablets came out, I was like, yes, like that's the future of comic books. And I just like I want. There's got to be some way to like get this into our coach, uh, into our social consciousness. Like the comic books are another medium. Like pe- a lot of people uh, have stopped reading books, but like with books and film and television, like people keep up on all of those things and are like, when new books come out, they get excited. But when new comics come out, they don't notice because they're not going to a local comic book shop every week. What but I be- know a lot of people that like this kind of stuff. What would be really cool is if they just like took TV shows and started making monthly. Like a monthly, not necessarily a trade, but like a premiere, the premiere edition comic books that are a little thicker. Yeah. So if you had like like a CSI kind of well, comic do. book story, they do. That. They do. There are yeah. great many TV shows that have been doing that. Unf- I, a lot of them, I don't mean. Are I don't like mean just like the series ends. I don't mean just like ripoffs of like this is the same IP. I just mean in, in a strain of that. So it's like. So people who like watching the yeah, it's like crime you, you fiction like police or police procedurals, yep. here's a police procedural comic. Well, I think that a you lot like, of yeah. you know, whatever uh, you like well, sitcoms, here's a sitcom style. I comic. think this is all very this this is an entirely this starts to branch into an entirely different uh conversation, which is one we've had before, which is there is the comics buying audit. There's the comics buying community, and then there's the community at large. And for the community at large, when you say comic books, they think stuff for kids or Superman. And well, that, and I and think that's yes, that's, but I think that that we exist at a time now where we have the capacity to change that because absolutely. of tablets and because yeah. superheroes are so popular now, and you have that big push into other mediums absolutely i think you now have an audience of teenagers and younger kids who are like i love thor i love iron man i want this that's going to bring more people into actually looking at comics absolutely especially on you know oh here's a comics app for my ipad let me put that on there let me grab these things for my kids Oh, what's this other thing that's being advertised? Like you have that point of access that you can bring people into the media. Oh, absolutely! Now. I think it's, but you need to present them with things that are going to appeal to them, which isn't necessarily 
the X-Men or the Justice League. Oh, no, right? and I agree with you completely. And that's why I think that the digital distribution is definitely going to be one of the ways we combat that. But right. it's it's a war on many fronts. It yeah, is. I think that the, not, the distribution no, no. method is what like keeps a lot of people out because right now the distribution method is essentially comic book stores. Yeah. And a very small shelf in, like, your local Barnes & Noble. Yeah. And if you go to that shelf in Barnes & Noble, like, you have no idea what you're looking at. Like, yeah. it's not arranged by genre. It's not arranged by anything. It's just, like, these are comic books. Well, that and the people that work at Barnes & Noble. Not everyone. Not everyone. The most of them don't know. But, but most, 90% uh, of the people that you're going to talk to, 95, maybe 99% yeah. of the people you're going to talk to. The local well, Olympia yeah. Barnes & Noble in uh, West <laughs> Olympia has a very knowledgeable comic book guy. Who's a shop customer so oh. at OCC? So nice. Yeah, shout out. I'm not gonna say his yeah, name. But, though. Yeah. I mean, you are that. right. Like you go to a bookshop and it's like, here's the fiction. Right. Here's the mystery. Here's yeah, the thriller. Here's exactly. the science and fiction. If you romance, romance, my and if you section. go to the comic book section, it's like, here are the comic books. I like yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's if you ask them or like the main things that a, a, a bookstore person is gonna read are the the best sellers, the, the ones that they can pitch real well like oh we have 32 copies of this it just came out i would recommend it yeah that is their bread and butter and that's one of the reasons you won't see very many knowledgeable comic well and also the comic books they're just not selling in the numbers that you know that that need to be sold but i think that joe's right like the digital the digital distribution method is one way that we combat that but we need to like the industry still hasn't quite figured out the model for that yet because even the digital well, distribution model for books is pretty shitty still and, the and thing they've been doing is, that for longer than comics it's so. just i mean look at and and we're gonna you know if we want to talk about this you have to look at the way that like pulp literature from the 20s and 30s stuff like the maltese falcon that's only now in the last 10 years coming to prominence academically and being spoken about in an academic way and it is incredibly rich yeah. I mean, there is a lot to talk about there. And so comics faces that same thing where, you know, people were looking at these things being written and it's like, well, you know, how important can they be? Because they're, you know, it's like, it's a mystery. How important can a mystery be? Yeah. When there's like plenty there and there's a really rich world there and there's just about every conceivable kind of mystery that you could want. You want a cowboy mystery? There's cowboy mysteries. You want Victorian mystery? There's Victorian mysteries. You want sci-fi mystery? There's sci-fi. It's, it's everywhere. Right. And so the thing is, is that pigeonhole does, pigeonholing does a disservice to everything it touches. Sure. And one of the well, reasons... That's why I hate genres, to be no, honest. No, absolutely, like, because it's a way of it's, sticking well, things into a box and right. not having to really unpack that box. But it is... It, it can become useful to, like, divide things up when it comes to, you know, how to find other things similar to what I like. Yes. You know, and the genre is only useful if it's like, look, I really love genre X... What other media, whether it's television, comic books, movies, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, video games, are in that same genre? Like, that's when it becomes slightly useful, but I I I really dislike it when it's like, let's just peg everything in there. And I I think that with... We're getting closer to digital distribution, and, like, I'm excited about that. I think that Marvel Unlimited is doing something really smart with the subscription service. Oh, yeah. And I'm just, you know, I'm waiting for someone to really take over... The indie uh, distribution, I think that Comixology is like getting a lot closer, but our price point, I think, is still way, way, way too way high. Yeah, yeah, well, it's I, way off. I actually think this is a really great time to be a comic reader. Yeah. Like the last 10 years, it's just been oh, getting absolutely. better and better. I agree. More and more indie stuff has been coming out. The quality has been getting higher. Like there's a lot of really great stuff to read that was just very, very on the margins. Mm-hmm. Back in you know the eighties and the nineties, I think that even absolutely. though the sales are down from them, I think that this is like we're living in a golden age of comics no, right now. There's I agree. So much with to the read. advent of the internet and uh, the success of comic book movies, we absolutely are. And that's the thing is that I think a lot of these things will change. I don't want to say on their own, but with very little urging, because yeah. people are going to get into it. Things are going to start. It's something uh, people you know, are excited you, about. Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's basically all you need to well, draw. I mean, is... the other thing, too, that we've I don't think we've ever really talked about here, but more and more 
libraries are, Car- are like carrying graph- like really read, good selections of graphic yeah, I read novels. the first seven read. trades of Invincible from our local library. Yeah, it's I, like, I when I when so I moved great. to Olympia four years ago, um, I had no money and tons of time on my hand, and I didn't know about our co- local comic book stores here yet. Um, and so I read, oh god, I don't even tons of stuff. I mean, yeah. probably. Um, for about the first two months, all I read was stuff that I checked out from our library till I yeah. kind of exhausted that. And it's only gotten better and better oh, over totally. the last few years exponentially. And, um, I mean, you go online and there's so much more out there now about um, literacy, how it helps literacy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just reading an article where they talk about um, there's a thousand um, or there's like the thousand most used words um, for kids between the ages of like five and ten. Um, and like they use Spider-Man as an example. Um, uh, the average Spider-Man comic uses, uh, I, I think it was like 40 words that are not in those, those thousand most commonly used words. And there's studies showing now that kids that have read comics from the time they could start reading use more words than other kids who don't read comics up. Um, are using, you know, things like that. I mean, it's just little things like that that are starting to come out. And as they, as, um, you know, society becomes more aware of things right. like that, it becomes more socially acceptable. When I was a kid, my parents would go to the library every single week. I mean, they're, they're writers. And like yeah. they were going to the new releases section to get books like right when they came out or like right when they got to the library. Right. And I, so I was going to the library every week before I could even read. And I would always go straight to the comic book section and I would grab... Garfield and Doonesbury and Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes, Hobbes. Yes. and Doug they have like the a few other random things. <laughs> <laughs> I loved Doonesbury when I was a little kid. Ah, oh, it was so good. I but like they had a few random things, like the Star Trek comic book from yeah. like the eighties. Yeah. Um, and I read those comics like all the time I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Like, and I mean, I was reading comic books that my brother was getting before I could read, and then when I was like learning to read, that was a big help. Yeah. And you see people posting pictures online now. Like, I went to my local library and look at what I got. And literally, it's a stack of graphic novels, like, two feet feet tall. Yeah. And they're like, I only got this many because that is how many books I'm allowed to check out at one time. Yeah, I mean, it's not just There's, like, like so much more. I'm going to be going there for months. Right. If you haven't been to your local library... Go oh, because there's it. such a wealth of stuff that you can read, yeah. and if they even don't, if you have, don't it, have a big budget, ask for it. Right. Well, it. yeah, and that's the great thing is like the libraries are really responsive to who's asking for what. And if um, I know that the the town that I grew up in, Spokane, like has a really good um, loan like lending uh, system, where Inter- you could, li- like, library, yeah, library. where they would like send books to other libraries. So like it might not be at your local library, but make sure you ask because like you may be able to get it sent to your libraries and go pick it up. Absolutely. So I think that stuff's great. I think that libraries are also now getting um digital yeah. lending, like lending out books. Yeah. And I'm sure that if you ask them about it, if you put pressure on them, they'll look into getting the same thing for comic books. Yeah. I don't think the infrastructure exists now, but no. I could easily see it being something that does exist in the future. And oh, I yeah. think it's super important. I I think the more uh like elementary school and middle school libraries should be taking note, and, and, of and a lot libraries. are. I and, mean, I was just listening to some podcasts about that, where yeah. um, a lot of librarians now that grew up reading comics are pushing to have, um, you know, young adult and, and children's graphic novel sections and things like that. Um, and it's just great to see that because that's that's not the beginning because the beginning's obviously already happened. Um, but that's one of the first major steps is when you get that in the schools. Um, I mean, and it really does help literacy uh, because, you know, these, these kids who wouldn't pick up books that, that are just all words, they'll pick up, you know, they'll pick up comic books. Yeah. They read something that, you know, like Spider-Man that talks a lot about science things. They get excited about that, you know. I mean, it, that's, that's the beginning. What? And it's exciting to be in this time where that's really becoming, um, you know, uh, a thing that's happening. Yeah. And, um, I, and, and I'm just excited to see where it goes. And you know? I think it can only go up from here. Like another thing is when you get kids reading about a subject that they're really interested in, they're like more, they'll read a lot more of it. And mm-hmm. then, so, you know, if you, if you give them I mean, Lord of the flies or something and they're just like, not, they're not into literature. 
they're gonna have a hard time really reading a lot. But if well, you who give wants them to stuff, read Lord of the Flies anyway. But if you give, and, and this is like, book. it's a, a there's a huge argument for like, why are we giving our junior high and high school kids literature? Like they can worry about reading that later in life. Like what's more important well, is like that they that actually hundred years old. Yeah. That they actually know how to read. Like what's the point of reading Shakespeare if every single joke is gonna go right over their head because we don't use that language anymore? Because you have to, yeah, because you have to teach you what a joke is, what a Shakespearean joke. I remember, well, I remember, I, yeah, I remember this. Too. I remember being. T- taught what a Shakespearean joke was for two weeks before we read our first And I remember every time that a joke happens, you have to like take the language, the words that we don't use anymore and like figure out why they're like gross, dirty puns because... Yeah. You, it's just yeah. words we don't use anymore. And I, so I'm like, what's, just, how's that useful? I just watched a video recently about just the way that they pronounce words that we still use today mm-hmm. has changed. Like the word whore in Shakespearean times rhymed with the word hour hmm. and so there's Whore. this like really Whore. great Whore. pun Whore. of like Whore. time you know traveling from hour to hour and he's talking about like going from whore to whore right i forget which play it's from but there's like there's a ton of really yeah. dirty jokes in shakespeare that yeah. nobody yeah. gets anymore just because we don't read those words that way and i, I guess mean, how is that useful to learn in high school well, what wouldn't you if you if the point is to get kids to read which i assume is the reason that they're having you read things i don't actually know what high school is for i've never been able to figure it out but like if the point is to get you to read things then why not, why do they care what yeah. you're reading like I, I remember reading jurassic park in middle school which is like not a book from like middle school kids really like it's much bigger than the books they want you to read but everyone being like well you shouldn't be reading that like that's a book for adults Wow, really? And yeah, she, and it was like, I was like, had why? That, there was one year in middle school where they had that at the book fair, and like, I just picked it up off the shelf, and I was just like, thumb, thumbing through it, reading it, Yeah. and then I put it down, and it was like halfway through the next period, and I had totally lost track of time, and I had to come to class late, and I got in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Because I was reading this book that I just got so absorbed into. Yeah, yeah and the, I think... The Jurassic Park is good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I love that book. Really but good. See, I think that the, that's the kind of thing that you want to get kids interested in. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of jumping back. I mean, I remember just like how tiring it was, like like having to learn for two weeks to read this book, and then being totally underwhelmed uh, by the book, yeah. and not really wanting to read Shakespeare anymore. I mean... God, I feel that way now about <laughs> I'm reading Jane Eyre for a oh. class, and I'm like, I don't care. This book has absolutely no effect on me. I understand yeah. that it's a brilliant piece of Victorian literature. Blah, blah, blah. Don't care. Don't care. But I'm not enriched by it. And there's it. so many comic books I would rather have people read oh, than God. books like that. Because they're like, I, like I said, like they, like Toby said about this book, like it has a great message. And like whether or not it's a fantastic story, like it's kind of irrelevant. Like yeah. it's a fun read. We all enjoy and, it. And, and that's really the thing. And I think we've hit this point pretty well. But the last thing that I wanted to add was... The two things that helped me to learn to read and to spell better than anything else, one was comic books, the other was video games. Yeah. Because I was playing all of those Sierra Quest games from the 80s, mm-hmm. because when I was like uh, four or five, uh, we got a computer that a friend of my parents put King's Quest Three on. Nice. And you have to type in all the commands to play that game. And so I was like asking my mom, like, how do you spell jump? Because I yeah. couldn't remember, and then right. I did it a few times, and then I remembered. Yeah. And, like, playing those games taught me how to spell. Yeah. Yeah. Way Quest better than any like, class that I went to in elementary school. Yeah. Did the beatings also help? There's no, no beatings. <laughs> Police Quest was awesome because you were like, like, okay, shoot gun. And it's like, you just shot yourself in the leg. Oh, um, slash draw gun. Now shoot gun. <laughs> Your gun, gun isn't loaded. Shoot gun at man. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I still remember that game was the. F- we got stuck for like a month because we had to go to the hotel and it said there was no hotel. And then I heard my grandmother use the word motel. And I was like, is that a thing? Because I'm a little kid. Like, I don't right. know what a motel is. So I was like, try go to motel. And then that worked and we could finish the game. That's great. <laughs> Well, in the days of gaming before the internet, uh, they would just sometimes be like, I guess I don't finish the game because I don't yeah, know where to go. I don't know where to go. I'm definitely yeah. many this game games. game is done. I was many actually super pissed done. when they switched from the text interface to point and click because yeah. I felt like it really dumbed the games down. Well, mm-hmm. it also was just like, it had there were too many things you could interact, too many ways you could interact with stuff. It was like, touch it, look at it, um, smell it, Takes lick it. it. Yeah, yeah, like it was, uh, it was dumb. 
Um, anyway, anyway does anyone have anything else to say about Strange Attractor Attractors? Uh, it's great, and you should definitely read it if you haven't already. You should wow. read it. A book that I recommended. Toby, Toby likes. It likes more <laughs> I, than I, everybody I, else. Too. I'm honestly considering this for my book of the year. Wow. I, I thought it was really good. Wow. And I did. I looked at the copyright information again. It does actually say original graphic novel published cool. April 2013. Yeah. I'd have right. to go back and look at what we did to pick my book of the year. But it would probably be the one that upset Toby the most. Black no, no, I mean, Black <laughs> I was already thinking. We can just yell some more about this racism. year. But, um, yeah. Uh, My book of the year's year was uh, Cars, Volume Two. <laughs> <laughs> hey, What's, hey, you so, don't know. Maybe they explain how oh they God, make the buildings. I don't even care maybe, anymore. Maybe we should do Cars. I don't even care. Yeah. I don't care. So yeah. recommendations. Yes. Recommendations. Uh, Joe, what'd you bring? I brought something I brought before. Uh, it's Warren Ellis's Global Frequency. Uh, Warren Ellis's Global Frequency is basically that there is a network. Of of one thousand and one people that are tasked with uh, when it is balls to the wall, the world is going to end, and we need somebody in any conceivable place to stop it. You call it the global frequency, and uh, are they the one thousand and one nights? There's. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's people of, of of just about every conceivable skill and. Um, uh, just, it's really kind of an interesting idea, and it's set up episodically so that each one is a different inst- instance of the global frequency. Uh, and most of them kind of uh, include Miranda Zero, who's the uh, the lead agent and founder. Uh, but uh, it's it's got a Warren Ellis does all the writing, but it's got a who's who of artists. Uh, You've got Steve Dillon in there. You've got just a bunch of people. I, I don't. Even, I can't even go into it because each there's. I think there's probably five uh, issues in each trade, Sounds and right. each one has a different artist. So, um, but it's a lot of fun, and it's very like spy uh, intrigue uh, craziness. The art is great. I'd, uh, I'd almost liken it to the inverse of a heist. Yeah, it, it I mean, almost the, the, is. The whole yeah. thing about a heist is like you've got a situation, you've got to come up with a plan, you pull in the experts, like you do the whole thing. And this is kind of the opposite of that. There is a crisis, and the global frequency is like the best of the yeah. best in whatever their field is. And they call in the people that they need, and they're like, okay, how do we solve this problem? Absolutely. Uh, to give just a brief example, on one of them, uh, the agent they call is a, park, a parkour. Uh, expert, and she's running through London, literally like doing her parkour thing to go because this, these small group of people are trying to release a chemical weapon in the middle of London. And while she's doing that, the this suspect they've picked up is being interrogated by somebody who specializes in interrogation techniques. And so it's like the the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It's kind of writ, writ large. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. it's great. I love it because it's great fun and it's something you can kind of. Pick up and read in an afternoon, and then kind of put down, and it doesn't really. I love like it because it's like the perfect novels. toilet reader. It really is. It's, 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 it really because you can just sit down and read an issue, and it's self-contained. There's really no thread yeah. running through it, except for Miranda Zero and the global frequency. Oh, and Aleph. Like, yeah, that's a different thing. Yeah. There, so, I mean, there is a meta plot, but it only developed so far because the series only lasted so long. Yeah, but I mean, you never really feel like. Uh, I mean, I, I don't really You, you feel can pick like, up any given issue and enjoy yeah, it without, without necessarily having, having read everything that. that comes before. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a strength to reading it in the order that it came out, but at the same time, there's it's not necessary. Yeah. Which and is the way that things like that should be. Yeah, it would totally. have made a good TV show. It would have made an excellent TV Actually, show, and yeah. I haven't held... I'm still holding out hope. But they, it's collected if now. If you don't giant know, they, they did a pilot episode that was never... It wasn't picked up for a series. Yeah. But, with, but I've heard the pilot is really good. I haven't actually watched it. But I mean, with, with the know. amount of comics on TV these days, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, and I think that they're their, they're mining older stuff, looking yeah. for show potential after the success of you know Walking Dead. Yeah. So it's uh, re- I have it when they released it in two volumes, two smaller volumes. I think it's released now in a bigger volume. Mm, still, the two volumes. Still, still, still the two volumes. Yeah. volumes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was looking. It needs Amazon. like a it's big hardcover. Wildstorm, cover. right? It's yeah. yeah. Wildstorm, Wildstorm DC. DC. Yeah. So it needs a bigger hardcover, but 
right now. That'd be nice. Two affordable trade paperbacks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So nothing so wrong with that. Super good. All there right. you go. Check it out. All right, Maddie, what, you, what got, you got? All right, um, I'll be quick about it because this book's already been pitched uh, before. I just really liked it, and the second trade finally came out. So, um, or the second hardcover, I should say. Uh, it's Thor: God of Thunder. It's the new Marvel Now Thor series. Uh, it's written by Jason Aaron. Uh, the art's by Saad Ribic. Um, it's really great. Like I said, I won't spend too long on it. Uh, it's uh, 12 issues, I believe, um, for the first two trades. Yeah, I don't um, remember what episode I pitched it on, but go back and listen you, to I that, I guess. Those are but... the last four weeks. No, no it was longer we ago were, than that. I, I pitched we it right were... when the last issue of it came yeah, out. Yeah, uh, we, okay. we, were, we were in the garage. Oh, we were still in the garage. We were. Oh, yeah. I mean, in our super fancy <laughs> studio. <laughs> our recording space. Our $10,000 yeah. million. Dollar, yeah, I no. want to say maybe it was the Killing Joke episode. It could have been. I think wrong. so. It was about yeah. that time. It was, but yeah. do you want to give a quick elevator pitch of the plot? Uh, sure, yeah. It's essentially a uh, deal with uh, Thor over three different times. It starts out with him when he's younger, before he has the hammer, mm-hmm. um, and he's pretty much just like party Thor in the beginning, <laughs> which is... Party the, with the Vikings Thor? Yeah, just hanging with the Vikings Thor. Wait, didn't um, I see this on Twisted Toy Fair Theater? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> you did, the whole thing. Um, Forsooth, why is there uh, vomit in my helmet? <laughs> uh, good times. Um, yeah, and uh, it basically deals... Uh, and then there's the current like Avenger era Thor. Yeah. Um, and then there's Thor in the future. Thor when at like, the end of time. At the end of time. He's he's the all-father at this yeah. point. He's missing an eye. He's like the badass. He's got his arm, badass. his destroyer's yeah, arm. Yeah, he's got the destroyer's arm. Um, and it's basically dealing with him interacting with the God Butcher, which is this uh, entity... Uh, that goes through time and space, uh, or to, just to kill space, to kill gods. Well, time too. Times, yeah, Later. time too as well. But yeah. to kill gods, yeah. He's... Um, and so it's the different times that he interacts with this character, and it's it's really well written. Um, it's a great, great story. The art's amazing, um, and it's one of those stories where. The end does not let you down. Like, no, yeah, uh, I I think I hadn't read the ending when I pitched it because it was like the week that it was coming out or something. Yeah, yeah. and Toby was like, I can't wait till you read the end. Because oh my god! It, it's and so after good. I read it, and I was the, like, it's fantastic. And even the epilogue issue after this arc actually ends is really great too, and yeah. it might I be in the think it's second trade. trade. I'm not sure. I, I think okay. it is in the trade, but. It's yeah, I don't remember what issue number. Well, no, it's it's, it's a great great yeah. series. And if you haven't read Thor and you're going to go see the movie because it should be coming out right at t- around the time this episode drops, uh, this is a great series to read. Yeah, it is. And actually, the first couple issues of the next arc have come out and they're pretty solid too. Um, yeah, and they're and actually it, dealing with Malkith the Accursed, who's going to be the villain in the movie. W- weird that that would happen. Synchronicity. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, so man, it's it's like the universe is like, that happened to happen that. at the same time. Huh. Oh, Marvel actually making really, really smart Savvy business decisions. decisions. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. 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 All right. So okay. I, I, told, I said I was going to be short, and I went way long. So Great, great series. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my book for this week is one that I think was pitched originally for our Ladies' Night episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. It's Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and Who's Fiona Staples. Uh, it's this really great series that's coming out right now. It's kind of... Science fantasy romance. It's basically set in a universe where there's this planet and the moon, and there's like all these science people who live on the planet and have like spaceships and stuff. And then all the magic people live on the moon and they have like horns and they use spells and stuff. And they've been having a proxy war for just years and years and years uh, throughout the galaxy. Uh, and one member of each group, basically, they meet and they fall in love and they have a baby. Mm-hmm. And now they're on the run as everyone is trying to kill them. Uh, yeah. It's a really this well-written is... series. It's a lot of fun. The art is absolutely awesome. beautiful. Fiona Staples, Staples stuff is, is, is really amazing. great. Yeah. This okay, is... so she also collaborates. So. Um, also, just uh, there's people with TV heads in this, so... You want to read if, it. If nothing yeah. else, you have to read it just because I told this you that. This series you're is to. quickly becoming my favorite of recent history. Yeah, it's really, really good. I hadn't read it when you pitched it last time. I have since read the first two trades. So good. Like, mind blowingly good. I, yeah. really, I really enjoyed it. And, and uh, I think that if you like stuff in that Vertigo tradition of, like, you know, stuff yeah. that Brian K. Vaughn wrote. Um, and this is actually also. Image, not Vertigo. Oh, okay. But, but yeah. if you like stuff in what I would consider, like, the the Vertigo... Like Sweet Tooth. Sweet yes. Tooth, yeah. and Why the Last Man, yeah. and, uh, you know, other things 
similar to that, I think that you'll really uh, um, unwritten. Oh, is the yeah, one I was yeah, trying to think of. Um, th- I think that uh, you'll really enjoy this. It's a great fantasy story. I yeah. will throw out one warning, though. Um, for younger readers, this does actually have quite a bit of sex and nudity in it. And violence. And, and, violence. and profanity. And people Medic blow their heads blow up. <sighs> but if, if you're the kind of person who is upset by a spider lady with naked breasts, um, maybe skip this. Or have somebody or- go through it with a black... Pen for you. Just <laughs> censor everything. Just send it to us and we'll do it. <laughs> we'll and censor send, it for you. We'll we will censor it, it and send it back. Yeah. So, yeah, that's Saga. Yeah. All right. Cade, what'd you got? Uh, a book that I hope nobody votes for because this table is full of fantastic <laughs> reads. Great pitch. Well, awesome. Done. Next. Well, <laughs> we all pick his book. Uh, Cade, what do you bring? Uh, I'm, I brought uh, the Young Avengers, um, the original one from 2005. Yeah. It was 12 issues long. Um, I got it when it was first coming out, and apparently they're back now. Oh, and it's yeah. This is uh, yeah, there's a new series by Kieran Gillian and Jamie McKelvey. That's a Mar- I think it's a Marvel Now title. Right. I think yeah. like issue 12 or 13 of that just came out. But, but a, this is the earlier right. Avengers. And a book that we talk about all the time, Hawkeye, has a character that I think premiered in this yes. book. Yeah. Kate Bishop. Uh, Kate yep. Bishop. And yeah, during, it was during the period that I think Hawkeye was not around. He was Ronin. Or he was Ronin. Oh, he was yeah, Ronin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's a younger woman, uh, Kate Bishop, who takes the name Hawkeye. And then yeah. when Hawkeye despi- decide, Clint Barton decides to be Hawkeye again, he has to like, take the name from her. Right. So if you if you him. like uh, if you like Hawkeye and Kate Bishop and you want to know where she came from, I think this series is awesome. I oh, think God, the twelve yes. issues. It, it, no, it really it is. Book, yeah. It is an incredible run. I'm just saying, you know, we've got <laughs> amazing. Stop shooting down your book. It's yeah. Good. I also, if you love, <laughs> it's awful. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Kang is pr- prominently displayed on the back cover of this hardcover, <laughs> and if that's not enough to get you excited about it, Kang. I always about Kang. The best lie. villain. If you're ever. actually looking for this in the store, it's uh, Young Avengers colon Sidekicks. Correct. By uh, yeah, I don't remember Heinberg what the next one Chum. is. But. Yeah, and there's two trades. That's the first one, and I think that. You know, if you like Avengers and you like Marvel superheroes, like you shouldn't skip this, especially since they're back in yeah. you know in in the Marvel mainstream now. And yeah, I've, I've actually been saying about the new Young Je- Avengers series for a while that it's kind of like floundering, and I think with the most recent epi- or issue, it's finally finding its feet and it's getting really good. And the yeah. art on the most recent issue is freaking incredible. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, the the penciler is Jamie McKelly. I believe Mike Norton did some of the inks on the most oh, that's recent cool. issue. Yeah, since I, we talked about uh, revival. Also, I can't ago. believe I was talking about Mike Norton on the show, and I was like, oh, uh, you know, he does mostly superhero stuff. I can't believe I forgot about Battle Pug, which is like my favorite thing that he does, <laughs> which is like the Conan the Barbarian that rides on pugs. All right, Kate, anything else you want to say about Young Avengers? Uh, it's good. You should read it. All right. Yeah, read it. Good job. Okay. Uh, this week I brought um, another Marvel book, the, a new Marvel book, because I've just been reading a lot of the new stuff. And uh, it's The Superior Spider-Man. Um, and something I really love about this book and like what Matt recommended and, and Hawkeye and all the books we've been talking about is I read these all like as two trade, basically like 16, 12 to 16 issue arcs in some cases. Uh, independently from one another and because the world is not as shared as it once was it's so easy to just pick up like one book and read it and not have it cross over with like 20 or 30 things at a time and what happens in the God Butcher is like at some point he meets up with Iron Man and it's just like oh it's cool it just reminds you that like Iron Man is still in this in Superior Spider-Man Volume 2 like he meets up with the Avengers but it doesn't really matter if you haven't been reading the Avengers or not and I think that's something that's a real strength of Marvel yeah. I wanted to get that out of the way before I pitched they're, the book they're doing a really great job right now I, I'm loving everything I'm reading from them I think it's fantastic so uh, Superior Spider-Man if you don't know what's been going on in Spider-Man recently uh, Doc Ock dies but he grafts his mind. He swaps brains with Peter Parker. So well, he's in Peter Parker's body, and Peter Parker is in Doc Ock's body. And then Doc Ock's body dies. This right. is an amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. Like this, that arc ends with, I think, number 700. Right. But something that's important about this is that he's not... Peter's subconscious isn't gone from Spider-Man's mind. Right. He's, like, superimposed himself over the top of Superman. Well, you, of Spider-Man. So Spider-Man's, like, inside of his own head watching Doc Ock. Well, you, yeah, you find out at the end of the first issue of this arc that... Because in the first beginning of the first issue, you, you think Peter's gone, and he's not. Mm. He's, like, 
a disembodied spirit in his own brain. Right. And you find out at the end of the first issue. Right. Minor and, spoiler. Right. But it's the end of the first issue. And it's important to the story, like, that Peter is trying to get his body back from Doc Ock, Otto Octavius. I was wondering but in the how meantime, they were going to dodge that particular hurdle. Ah, don't, don't, don't feel smug quite yet, because there's more twists ahead. Uh, in the meantime, uh, what Doc Ock is, he's decided to become a superhero. He's decided to take on the mantle of Spider-Man and do it better than Peter Parker did it. And in almost every way, he is doing it better than Peter Parker. And so I find it really interesting that he's inventing all this new technology. He's sending Peter back to school and being like, you're going to get your PhD because it's keeping me from being able to be a better superhero. He's doing all this stuff. He's cleaning up a lot of the like social problems in Peter's life. He's just taking... He's taking superheroing very seriously and involving himself in the city in a way that Peter never did, where the cops are on his side now at some point. you know, yeah, He's working with he's working Jonah Jameson, who's, who's now the mayor, mayor of New York. And uh, he's just doing everything essentially better than Spider-Man can do it. And I think that what's really great about this series is, as we know in comic books, like it's obvious that at some point Peter will probably He'll take back, back his body. I'm assuming around the time that Amazing Spider-Man 2, the movie, comes out. Right. But uh, <laughs> what's great now in this book is Peter's kind of learning things from Otto and vice versa. Like, Doc Ock is learning about Peter's life and about like why Peter did some of the things the way he did. And it's like a really great character study of both Peter Parker and Dr. Octopus and a lot of his villains. I, I actually think that this is really interesting because I'm assuming Peter's going to be back eventually. Right. And I think it's going to be fun to see how Peter deals with all the changes that Doc Ock makes in his life when he eventually does show up because Doc Ock is pissing certain people off. Right. And making very big changes in Peter's life. And what I do think is really interesting about that is at some point when Peter comes back, like he's going to be able to take some of the improvements as well as like some of the downsides. And for anyone who's been reading Spider-Man for a long time, like Peter's kind of just been in this like weird state of stagnation. And so I think it'll be interesting to see Peter move forward as a hero. I finally. never forgave Marvel for taking away all his cool abilities that he learned during the other Story yeah, line. but they actually ended up giving those to Kane, who's now the Scarlet Spider. Oh, so right. if you want to read about that, there's a comic that does that. Uh, right. well, uh, yeah, I actually but... really love this series because later <sighs> on, in the most recent ep- issues, Spider-Man 2099 has shown up, and he's now in the present day. Yeah, and he's himself. stuck there, isn't he? And I love Spider-Man 2099. Yeah, I think <laughs> this series is great. I think that it's one of the Marvel books that everybody should be reading. Even if you're not a huge Spider-Man fan, it's that's, like a good that, introduction. That's what I was going to say, is just a real quick thing. I mean, really, the only Spider-Man stuff I've ever read is Ultimate Spider-Man, hmm. Bendis' Ultimate Spider-Man. Um, so I'm not really familiar with Which the character. Which we're going to be reading for our next episode of The Long Run. Yeah, If you didn't listen it. to that, and <laughs> it's going to be coming up in probably... A couple months. Six weeks. Yeah, a little bit. Maybe yeah. six weeks. But... Uh, Probably around the beginning of December. Yeah. So um, if you haven't started reading that yet, start doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a great uh, also introduction. It's a great jumping on point. It's doing exactly what Marvel now should be doing. Is it's and also it. Spider Man fans fucking hate this book, and that makes me so happy because it's like this is what needs to happen in comic books. Is a comic book company needs to take a chance on a writer, let them do more than two issues before the fans go, it's poopy, I don't like it, and then they cancel the book. I, like, Spider-Man has been my favorite superhero since I was a little kid, and I love this. I think yeah. it's great. I think it's actually changing, like making real changes in a character yeah. that actually like work and aren't just going to be like, okay, it's going to be undone. Like, yeah, yeah it's going to be undone at some point. Peter Parker will be Spider-Man again, but I feel like this arc will be a major influence in his life going forward. Yeah. And I think it's doing cool interesting fun thing and i respect <laughs> marvel for having the balls to keep uh dan slot on the book and just be like no just keep going like sure some of our hardcore fans are like it's not it's not peter parker spider-man and uh mary jane isn't his girlfriend and aunt may is not around it's like good i'm tired yeah, of all of that them. i'm tired people, of all people that. Are complaining now but in 10 years this is gonna be one of the classic more well, and i, I think the, the people that are the loudest uh you know, like they are speaking for a minority of the population because I, I talk to most people I talk to about this book really enjoy it. So, um, I re- really respect Marvel fans. Aunt May so. needed to be gone a long time ago. Yeah, that's not, and that's like, 
I, I, I just kind of want to... Uh, she's uninteresting. She's uninteresting Agreed. as a character. Well, she served her purpose in Peter's life. Like, yeah, it was exactly. important for her to be there, but now she that Peter's 35... a long time ago. He, or, mm-hmm. like, you know, older. He, he needs new characters in I his life. officially he's 25. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay. He, I could be he got I younger be. at some point because he used to age in real time. Well, not that real was time, what, real time. It was like every year in real life was like a month in comic time or something like that. Oh, yeah. There was a ratio. Stan Lee or whoever was writing Spider-Man talks about how he like wanted to actually age that character. So, But yeah, like he's whatever. post- College by a few years, so he's like in his mid to late twenties. Well, Still, not he should, it's, around. Doc yeah. uh, yeah, exactly. thinks he should have gotten his yeah, PhD just, by now. The so, age of yeah, Peter Parker is 30. completely not. In, I mean, like, well, Aunt May should what have is, been gone a long time. What is ago. important anyway. though is he's an adult now, and he shouldn't be making the same mistakes he was Absolutely. making when he was eighteen because they were interesting when he was eighteen. But now he just looks like a dumbass yeah. because right. he's been doing this for a long time. He should well, be better. And, and the whole thing is like. Spider-Man and Mary Jane are interesting where Spider-Man is having to balance the responsibilities of being a husband and being a superhero. Well, in a lot of the and same Mary ways. Mary Jane has her own thing going on. Right. Like, Mary Jane, of course... Well, let's let's not get into this whole Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. Right. Yeah, you know? but I mean, it's, a, it's important to see Peter right. balance his social life and his, his work life and everything yes. with this. And Doc Ock does really interesting things with that. So uh, that's what I really yes. like this series. All right. So, voting. Matt, what do you want to read? Um... Spider-Man. All right. Uh, I'm going to vote for Thor. Thor. I'm also going to vote for Thor. All right. Yay. Oh, well, I really want to read Thor and talk about it because I, I love this. Uh, I pitched it a while ago and fucking love this. So, uh, But for the record, I will vote for Saga because I also really love that. And I think everybody should read it. Yeah, Thank you. I want to vote for everything here. Cause this I, week only, yeah. is just phenomenal uh, recommendations. Yeah. Superior Spider-Man is one of the great Marvel Now books. Uh, so Global Frequency is great. Uh, Saga, like I said, one of my favorites in recent years. Yeah, it's a great idea. Thor ongoing. is everything that should be happening in comics in one book. And this Young Avengers book is awesome. I don't yeah, know why you were pitching it under the table, no, Kate, no, but it's, it's Avengers, really good. I really no, like it. No, it is very good. Just like It's the only one I haven't read already. And I like all the ones I have read, and I feel like I would probably like this yeah. when I read it. Yeah, I think you should read it. It's fun. And if you like Kate Bishop and, and those characters and Hulkling and... Uh, well, I don't even remember the rest Iron of Lad. Well, I think it's, it's yeah. good... In, Why do I know in, these names when I haven't read them? It's good <laughs> in the way that like Teen Titans was good, where it gives you a contrast. You know, the Avengers... They know what their job is, yeah, and they know how best to do it. But these are they're young, you know, yeah. they're idealists, and so they clash with yeah. these with the heroes that they're kind of based on, and so it's really interesting. Yeah, it's and, well written, it's beautiful to look at, and it's a lot of fucking fun. Yeah, those twelve issues are all really good. So, uh, like every week, read everything. And, read everything. Uh, we'll see you next time for but, Thor: God of Thunder. Yeah, was, especially yes. read Thor. Please, yeah, read that because we're going to talk. Like about our it. Facebook page, leave comments uh, wherever you go. Let us know, rate us on iTunes, do all that stuff. Subscribe, right. on, Subscribe YouTube on YouTube and YouTube. like us on YouTube also. Yeah. Awesome, and uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot all for right. listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.